So hello everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Juan Posada. I'm the moderator of uh, our session today on functional structural components of tropical ecosystems, part one. Uh, I'm a professor at the University of Rosario. And uh, um, oh, please, I see uh, Marina. Could you turn off your? Thank you. So. Uh, I'm a professor at the University of El Rosario. I'm also the, the, the co-chair of the Neotropical chapter, and I'm a co-organizer of this year's meeting and chair of next year's meeting. Uh, so it's for me a pleasure to um, uh, introduce our speakers today. We have 11 uh, presentations. I'm quickly gonna go over the titles and their names, affiliations. So our first talk is gonna be by uh, Ekaterina uh, Shorohova on coarse woody debris and under examined structural component of monsoon tropical forest. Uh, Ekaterina is from the Forest Research Institute for the Korean Research Center in the Russian Academy of Science. Then we'll have a talk by uh, uh, Krishna Anjua from Columbia University on biotic and biotic controls on seedling growth, combining experiment with long-term fields data in the Andaman uh, Island, Island in India. Then Santiago Vasquez from the University of Antioquia is gonna present a, a talk on functional trait that explain orthophosphate fluxes in scattered trees from fragmented Andean landscapes in Colombia. Then Nivia Bianca Lopez from the National Institute for Amazon and Research in Manaus is going to present uh, the growth re uh, reproduction trade-off in central Amazonian trees. Then uh, Omar Nebo from uh, the German Center for Integrative uh, Biodiversity Research, IDIV, will present on fruit scent as an honest signal for fruit quality. Uh, then we will have a talk by Jose Miguel Chavez Fallas from the University of Missouri in St. Louis on ecological and architectural traits that structure uh, role leaf beetle community in Costa Rican wet forests, Zingi Berales. Uh, then Laura Martins from the from IMPA, the Institute of National de Pesquisa Amazonica in Manaus, will present wood density variation and its relationship with the environmental space occupied by trees in central Amazonia. Then Diana Acosta Rojas uh, from uh, Senken uh, Biodiversity and Climate Research Center in Frankfurt will present plant trade association with abo uh, abiotic and biotic uh, factors in tropical mountain forest. Then Elenis Avila Lovera from the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute in Panama is presenting what influences bark conductance to water vapor in neotropical plants. And Marina uh, Fagundes from the University of Alperialdo Rio Grande do Norte will present disentangling facilitation and functional complementarity effect on biomass production community functioning during forest restoration. And at last, Mehicha uh, Guna Wardena um, from, um, I the, from Sri Lanka, uh, Horizon Campus, uh, sorry, will present the fauna diversity in Tangapua uh, Kunkles mountain range in Sri Lanka. So uh, just a quick reminder to all uh, our um, attendees, you, you, will, you will have, you will see on your, uh, this is different from the panelists who are connected from another um, uh, link in Zoom, but the, uh, the attendees you see in your Zoom window, uh, a little Q&A uh, windows at the, back, at the bottom, please ask your questions using that function. Do not go, uh, WUVA, the, the application we use for, uh, managing the, the webinar also has this little uh, a, a, a possibility of asking questions, but do not use WUVA. Please use the Zoom questions so we can see those questions as they come. You can ask questions at any time. Uh, so write your question. Please make sure to include the name of the person of the uh, of the panelist uh, before asking. Put the name before asking your question so we know who to direct it to. The to, to who should we direct the question to, and um, and and we'll have the question will be answered um, at the end of this of the session. So you will see the the talks on the they will be shown uh, continuously for about fifty minutes, and then we'll have a ten to about ten minutes for question and answer session. So um, I think that covers the main points. So. Welcome again, and uh, Patricia, please um, 
go ahead with the, our presentation. And please, we can the please. I remember, I remember, I remind the panelists to please keep their microphones uh, off and camera off during the presentation. Thank you. Hello, and welcome to beautiful Asian monsoon tropical forests. World wild, cause with the debris is known as an important component for forest ecosystem functioning and biodiversity. However, in tropical forests in general, and especially in Asian forests, there is very little information about coastal debris. This information is crucial for carbon cycling assessment and for better understanding of tropical biodiversity. We estimated coastal debris volumes, carbon stocks, decay class dynamics, and uh, studied decomposition patterns. Um, micro microbial or termite driven. The first study area is located in the border between Cambodia and Vietnam and the forests are lowland deep terracal forests. The second study area is located in mixed montane tropical forests uh, at elevation 150 meters up to 200 meters and more and the forests are deciduous mixed with coniferous tree species. We sampled coarse wood debris on transects, recording decay class, position, and morph mass fraction, and additional samples for carbon concentration and density. What did you figure out? First of all, deep terracard forests stored almost two times less coarse wood debris as compared to wet mountain forests. And for carbon fraction, this uh, ratio was even greater because in deep terracard forests, logs and snags contained also soil brought by termites. In a lowland deep terracard forests, the termite infestation averaged 73% for all decay classes, and naturally it increased with decay class. An interesting result is that carbon concentration was much lower as compared to IPCC default 50%, so it was only 42%, and it didn't depend on decay class. In a montane mixed forests, the composition was mainly microbially driven or fungal driven, wood density decreased with decay class independently on position and um, mort mass fraction. So it was the same for snacks, uh, lying, lean, leaning logs, uh, stumps and branches. And carbon fraction averaged 47%. And like in previous case, it didn't depend on decay class dynamics. Cost wood debris stocks depended on elevation and forest type. The lowest values were found in cloud forests located at the altitude of 2,000 meters above sea level, and maximum values were observed in uh, broadleaf forest with an admixture of Fokienia hodgensi, beautiful big tree. Line and leaning logs dominated among coastal debris types. However, the share of branches was very high. In dipterocarp forests, it was almost 30%. Branches came from uh, branch fall, which is typical for tropical forests as compared to boreal or temperate forests. Conclusions so far, cosmic debris volumes depended on forest type and elevation. Lowland deep terracard forests stored almost two times less coarse wood debris as compared to wet mountain forests. Line logs dominated among coarse wood debris types. However, the share of branches, especially in deep terracard forests, was also rather high. Coarse wood debris distribution by decay classes was characterized by bell-shaped form and um, second and third class dominated. Carbon fraction averaged 42 and 47 percent, respectively, for deep terracarp and wet montane forests. In the deep terracarp forests, uh, decomposition was mainly termite driven, and in wet montane forests, we observed mainly fungal decay. Thanks for your attention and looking forward to hear your questions. Thanks.
Hi everyone, I'm Krishna Anujan, starting my sixth year of my PhD with Professor Shahid Naeem in the E3B department at Columbia University. Today I will be presenting ongoing analyses in a thesis chapter trying to understand what drives seedling growth in the forests of the Andaman Islands, India. Before I go ahead, I want to thank the people who made this project happen. I'm grateful to E3B and National Geographic for funding, the Andaman Nicobar Environmental Team, Annette, for logistical support, and the Department of Environmental Forest Andaman Nicobar Islands for permit, resources, and patience. This project happened with the help and support of the diverse environment of the Naim Lag, my field station family at Annet, and the incredible team managing the long-term ecological monitoring plots in the Andaman Islands. For this work, I look at the growth of tropical tree seedling communities. Seedling growth is understood to be affected by both biotic and abiotic mechanisms, but the relative influence of each of these is poorly understood. Light is an important microclimate condition that affects the rate of growth of tree seedlings. Further, plant diversity is known to increase seedling growth. However, plant diversity is also known to increase uh, plant pathogen and herbivore or plant enemy diversity, and how this affects plant damage is not entirely clear. Why are understanding these uh, these mechanisms and their interactions important. This could be uh, important to understand the, uh, <clears throat> understand the maintenance of mixed deciduous forests, which are a common type of forest in uh, many tropical landscapes. Uh, in the Andaman Islands, for example, canopy species such as uh, diprocarpus that are evergreen and tetramelus that are deciduous can coexist in the same land, the same uh, forest stand, uh, creating heterogeneous microclimate conditions in the understory which can then impact seedling growth. To try and understand these sets of mechanisms, I set up a manipulative experiment on native tree seedlings in the Andaman Islands. The setup is a fully cross light and plant diversity treatment. The light treatments are three, an evergreen canopy, an open canopy, and a deciduous canopy, which is open during the dry season and closed during the wet season. Plant diversity treatments are either one, three, or six species from a pool of 10 native tree species seedlings. Uh, I also combine these data with long-term field data collected by the Long-Term Ecosystem Monitoring Network from this landscape. I set the experiment up at the Forest Department Silviculture Research Nursery uh, in the Andaman Islands with the help of three undergraduate research assistants from the Andamans, Adisha Shokirfan, uh, photographed here. We used seedlings germinated in the nursery for replanting into selectively logged forests. We ran the experiment for a year and collected monthly census data on individual seedling growth and damage status. Uh, and uh, with this, we also hope to be able to contribute information towards their local management. For this talk, I'm focusing on plot level information. A repeated measures ANOVA of the total basal area, a proxy for biomass, shows that canopy treatment and time have significant effects on seedling growth at the community level. Moreover, putting this together with species diversity treatment and using a three-way ANOVA, we see no strong interaction between light and diversity treatments. However, we do see some effects uh, of diversity on the three species, um, uh, uh, an interaction at the three species uh, treatment between light and diversity, but this does not, is not a consistent effect. And this is likely because of differences in the percentages of evergreen and deciduous species in our treatments. Uh, we see that light is a strong predictor of growth in growing communities. A structural equation model of these original hypotheses showed a good fit to the data with p-value one. The canopy treatments had significant effects on both biomass gain in the course of the year and average plant damage, but the diversity treatments did not have significant effects on biomass gain. However, when we looked at long-term field data from the landscape in comparable plots with similar species richness and abundance uh, and having mixed deciduous, uh, and in a mixed deciduous stand, we saw that both canopy treatment and, the, and plant species richness had significant and comparable effects on average biomass uh, in the plot over the course of the year. Uh, moreover, the effect of both canopy treatment and plant species richness on plant damage were significant. We see in sum that the processes impacting growth vary with time or age of a seedling community. In a non-equilibrium or growing community, we see that light has a very important role in seedling growth, while in a steady state community on field, we see that both light and species diversity matter to seedling growth and diversity affects growth both through the di its direct effects as well as through indirect mechanisms through plant damage. That's all I have for now and thanks for listening in.
Hello, my name is Santiago Vasquez. Our research work is titled Functional Traits Explain or to post phase Flows in Scattered Trees from Fragmentae and Dion Landscape in Colombia. The availability of the nutrients in ecosystem is generally conditioned with their natural availability on the earth's surface and the efficiency of the transport mechanism that mobilizes them. Tropical ecosystems in South America, for example, are limited in phosphorus due to its depletion during long-term pedogenesis, as well as the lack of phosphoric rocks in the Canaanitan geology. This limitation is sufficient to limit productivity in old and eroded soils that characterize part of the tropical biomes, particularly in the mountains where geomorphology and climate lead to high rate of site erosion. This loss is more intense with forest fragmentation and forest loss. For instance, in smooth scattered forests, fragments or leftover trees after forest fragmentation, higher nutrients contents in the soils are observed, potentially relate to the capacity of trees to effectively mobilize nutrients. We determine the association between plant functional traits and phosphorus movement from the canopy in 20 individuals or 5 tree species scattered in a modified landscape. Crotus magdalenensis, Tibochina lepidopta, Bismia vasifera, and Quercus humboldti which are native to the tropical Andean, and uh, one exotic species, Eucalyptus globulus. We developed measurements in 12 functional traits in each individual. Besides, we quantified false phase concentration in precipitation, truffle, and steam flow in all trees for a group of 14 individual rainfall events. Concentrations were low overall for all species except for the species Crotus magdalenensis. We observed native species showed higher concentration, potentially really associated with graded complexity in their structure and composition that they introduced species Eucalyptus globulus. The common observation is that the water passing through the canopy of trees is enriched in phosphate, which suggests that the greatest contribution occurs in the exchange with foliage surface and the bark, presenting itself as dominant factor that controls the concentration and fluxes of phosphate at the individual scale. The highest concentration of phosphates are recorded in individuals with a specific trait configuration, finding greater relationship with characteristics such as epiphyte coverage and foliar traits such as leaf area and tracon density. We found associations between species based on their functional characteristics that potentially really facilitate biochemical exchange and improve ecological functions associated with the early stage of forest recovery overall or results highly the complex biochemical interaction that occurs in this highly biodiverse ecosystem where functional traits of plants can be useful in describing ecosystem function on the landscape scale.
Hi, I am Nivia. I college medicine at the National Institute of Amazonia Research. Reproductive effort generates costs for the organism demanding energy. Here, we consider two different life histories. Even if the availability of resources is the same, species A above invests into growth first and only later it invests into reproduction. Conversely, species B below allocates resources in reproduction at the cost of vegetative growth. The first species the first species will have a low size at the onset of maturity, while the second, by investing its resources in growth first, will have a delay at the beginning of the reproductive maturity. The best place to test diversity hypothesis is one, if not the most, diverse forest in the world. So we studied Princeton Forest in the central Amazon, Brazil, in this location, we used four plots with a total area of one hectare and that contained 626 trees from 233 different species. We visited each, each of these trees on some month and checked if there was any sign of reproduction blood, buds, flowers, or fruits. After, after 26 months, 45% of all trees showed at least one reproductive event. With this reproductive data, we fit hierarchical Bayesian models that describe the probability of reproduction for each tree along along the y-axis as a function of its size, diameter at breast height, represented by the x-axis. Each curve represents a species, and we can observe that short stature species in blue may start to reproduce in small size in the low critical diameter graph. But tend to have low fecundity, low maximum probability of reproduction. On the other hand, tall species in yellow can only start to reproduce at a, at a larger size. Critical diameter is higher, but may have very high probability of reproduction represented by a large maximum probability. We found evidence in support of demographic trade-off between fecundity, representing graph by maximum probability, and, and generation time represented in the graph by critical diameter. Because the larger species trees indicated by yellow dots in the graph will re reach a higher point and with a bigger canopy more exposed to light, it will guarantee more energy to reproduce. The small, the small species indicated by the yellow dots in the graph may not reach the canopy, suffering a reduced exposure to light, which will affect, affect the reproductive activities. I thank everyone who watched it especially my partners, uh, Marcel Weiss and to Zé Luiz Campana Camargo. And thanks everyone for watching. Hi, hello, my name is Omar. And today I would like to briefly, briefly introduce you to a study that I did with my colleagues on the question whether fruit scent in, is an honest signal for fruit quality. So fleshy fruits have evolved to be attractive to frugivores to uh, facilitate seed dispersal. And many traits of fruits have evolved as signals for these animals. The best example for this is fruit color that we know has evolved uh, to contrast against the background to facilitate detection of the fruits. But we also know that there is some relationship between fruit color 
and uh, nutrient content between signal and reward that might tell animals what they find in the fruits. Fruit scent, the bouquet of chemicals that are emitted by ripe fruits, gives us a very similar model, a very similar system. We know, for example, that the chemical contrast, so the difference between the way ripe and unripe fruits smell, is used by animals to identify ripe fruits. But fruit scent is a really complex trait. It's a product of dozens to hundreds of different chemicals, and many of them are synthesized directly from macronutrients that animals might be interested in. So this leads to the question whether we might see a, a relationship between signal and reward, between fruit scent, the way they smell, and uh, nutrient content, their quality. And you can address this question looking at many, many different chemicals and their associations with different macronutrients. But today I would like to focus on aliphatic esters. So aliphatic esters, very briefly, are a product of acid and alcohol. So we take acid and alcohol and we get on the other side uh, an ester and a molecule of water. And critically, many such acids and alcohols are direct products of fruit maturation. To give you the easiest example for this, uh, ethanol, ethyl alcohol, is a product of sugar fermentation. It is an alcohol, of course, but through oxidation it can also become an acid. Um, so this leads to the possibility that we have a direct biochemical link between aliphatic esters, the signal, and sugar, the reward. And the first indication that this might be the case comes from, from a study that we published two years ago that showed uh, that species that are more sugary have more esters, but this has not been really examined within species, which is, which is ecologically much more interesting because um, if the relationship holds within species, it becomes useful for animals that come to a tree uh, that they can use their sense of smell to identify whether each fruit is worthy or not. So to address this question, whether aliphatic esters signify sugar levels within species, I conducted a study on Ficus tilifolia. It's a species, it's a fixed species that grows in Madagascar and is dispersed by lemurs. And what I did was to sample the sugar levels and the vox, the chemicals in the scent of 80 figs from 15 individual trees. And I tested two predictions. The first straightforward one is that we're going to see a positive relationship between signal and reward, esters and sugar. The second one was that we're not going to see this relationship between non-esters in fruit scent and sugar. And the idea there is that when you sample the figs, some might be more ripe and some less ripe, you never really know. And it's possible that the relationship between signal and reward is simply a product of the fruit being more ripe. So a more ripe fig would have more sugar and also more scent chemicals. So to show that the relationship is due to the biochemical link between sugar and esters, I wanted to show that there is no relationship between non-esters and sugar. To give you very briefly the results, what we have here is the analysis between individuals. So each dot on the graph is an individual tree. Uh, and we have on the x-axis, we have the amount of sugar in the figs of this tree. And on the y-axis, we have in blue the amount of esters in these figs and in black the non-esters. And we can clearly see that indeed we have a positive relationship between sugar uh, and esters. So more trees with more sugary figs also have more esters but not more other scent compounds. And this results also holds within trees. So here what we have on the graphs, we have each dot is an individual fig and the colors represent different individuals. And we can see on the left hand side that again, we have a positive relationship between sugar and esters. So within tree, a more sugary fig would have more esters, but not more other compounds. This is on the right hand side. So these results confirm both predictions. We have a positive relationship between esters and sugar, but no relationship between sugar and other scent compounds. Um, and this gives us strong evidence that indeed fruit scent, at least in this species, is an honest signal for fruit quality. Yeah, and I would be happy to take questions if you have any. Thanks. Hi. My name is Miguel Chavez. I'm a PhD student at the University of San Luis, and today I'm going to talk about how ecological and architectural traits structure role leaf beetle communities on Costa Rican wet forest in Uberelis. The Zingiberellis is a group of plants that includes Heliconias, 
gingers and bananas. On these plants, the new leaves come rolled and they unfurl as they mature. Interestingly, there is a group of beetles that have adapted to complete their entire life cycle on these new rolled leaves. Here in the picture in the bottom right, we can see the damage that these beetles do to their host plant. At La Selva Biological Station in Costa Rica, this plant herbivore system consists of 33 species of Singivirellis and 20 species of beetles belonging to two genera in the family Chrysomelidae. At La Selva, thanks to previous work from Garcia Robledo and collaborators, we know which specific beetle species feed on each host plant, and we know the relative contribution of each host plant to each beetle species uh, diet. The Singivirellis are distributed in five plant families, so for each host plant species, we, uh, we determine its beetle species richness, which is the number of beetles feeding on each host plant, beetle abundance, that is the average number of beetle species per roll leaf sample, and beetle diversity used in a Shannon index. So the goal of this work is to understand the role of uh, ecological and architectural traits in structuring roll leaf beetle assemblages. Which plant traits structure roll leaf beetle communities? Recent studies on multi-species tropical plant herbivore system have focused on the study of different traits such as chemical compounds, physical traits, developmental traits, and biotic interaction. I will present the study of different, different traits in uh, other work, but today I'm going to focus on ecological and architectural traits. Therefore, we assess plant and leaf size, geographical distribution, elevational range, local abundance, habitat and soil for the for 26 species of Cinerigivirellis and La Selva. As a result, we found that out of the seven traits, only leaf width had an effect structuring raw leaf beetle communities. On this graph, each data point uh, represents a host plant species and they are colored by the family that they belong. We found that leaf width has a positive effect on beetle species richness, beetle abundance, and beetle diversity. In other words, the wider the leaves are, the more beetle species, the more beetles, and the more diverse their communities are. Lastly, through an ordination analysis, we confirm the effect of leaf width on beetle community structure. As the previous relationship was for the entire system, we decided to break down this relationship for each Singularis family. Interestingly, we found that the trend for beetle species richness and beetle diversity is the same for, for Heliconiaceae and Marantaceae, but not for Costaceae and Singularis. And for beetle abundance, we found that the trend is the same for all the Singularis families. As conclusions, we found that Singivirellis leaf width affects raw leaf beetle species richness, abundance, diversity, and community structure at La Selva. We also found that the effect of leaf width on, on raw leaf beetle species richness and diversity is different for the different Singivirellis families. And lastly, we hope that understanding how plant ecological and architectural traits structure herbivore assemblages will be helpful to develop faster and more precise actions to manage and protect tropical biodiversity. Lastly, I would like to thank my support and funding sources, the Marquis and Tamajos Lab, and all the people that in one way or the other have been helpful to make this work possible. Thank you very much. Hello everyone, I am Laura, I'm from Brazil, and today I'm going to present my work entitled Variation of Grid Density and its Relationship with the Environmental Space Occupied by Widespread Tree Species in Central Amazon. So, grid density is considered a key trait associated with tree growth and survival. This is because their values reflect investment in carbon per unit of area, and this investment could be related to environmental conditions, 
like, for example, it's well known that in an environment with low resources availability, like water and nutrients, we generally found species with higher wood density values. This is because the, this conservative strategy provides for them more safety, mechanical and hydraulically safety. On the other hand, in an environment with higher resources availability, we generally found species with lower with density values. These acquisitive strategies provide for them to invest in more efficient way their resources so they can grow and they don't need to worry about safety because they have these resources. So this is well known for these species that are related to these two kinds of environments. But what happens with widespread species? Do their individuals vary or converge the wood density values? If they converge, which, is, which strategy would be the best? Conservative or acquisitive? So for these questions, we have two hypotheses. This first one is that species that occupy a greater environmental space will vary more than with density values because these species are most subject to the variety, a greater variety of environmental conditions. So we expect some kind of adjustment of the strait to help them to survive this contrasting environment. On the other hand, if the species do not vary their wood density values, we expect that the species that occupy a greater environmental space will have higher wood density values because these conservative strategies will provide them more safety. For do that, to do that, we have we made an environmental space index based on characteristic of the plots where we found the individuals of our target species. When uh, a smaller number represented these species live only in a restricted area and the highest number represent that these species live in a more widespread, they are more widespread and live under more great uh, environmental conditions. So a variety of environmental conditions. So these species are more generalists. So we use a database with 285 with density values from 19 species from 16 plots along 500 kilometers of extension. We use near infrared spectroscopy analysis to confirm the identification of our individuals. We use coefficient of variation and the average of wood density to access this variation of the strait and to relate the wood density values with environmental space, we use linear regression. So our results show that species occupying a greater environmental space do not vary the wood density values. So like here in this graph, we can see that there is no evidence of adjustment of the strait based on environmental space occupied by the species. Instead of that, we found that species occurring in a more variable environmental space generally have lower with density values. This indicates that species with lower with density values in acquisitive strategies are more generalist and more able to thrive in contrasting environments. And this could indicate that in a global change scenario in the Amazon, it may favor low with density species to survive than conservative ones. Thank you, everyone. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Hi, I'm Diana, and I'm very pleased to be here with this talk about the first findings of my PhD. So plants exhibit a diverse sets of traits that don't always vary independently. For that reason, identifying the mean independent dimensions of tree variation may allow us to understand the extent to which plant traits are related and also the trade-off behind those associations. 
For instance, DSM collaborators use a very simple principal component analysis to examine the worldwide variation of six major plant traits. In this graph, the traits are represented by arrows and the extreme values of the traits by icons. So the most exciting thing in this work is that they identify two main independent dimensions of trait variation in plants worldwide. The first one is known as the size of whole plant and their parts and varies between taller plants with larger diaspores and a small plant with also a small diaspores. On the other hand, the second axis is known as the leaf economics spectrum, which balances the cost to produce leaves with cheaply constructed leaves, rich in nitrogen and with low leaf mass per area against those leaves that are more expensive to produce. After searching for general patterns of plant functional diversity, we can ask about the factors, about the factors that shape the diversity of traits in plant communities. And I can give you a quick answer that they are both abiotic and biotic factors through processes known as environmental filtering and interaction filtering respectively. At large spatial scales, these interactions have been widely tested, but at smaller scales where local factors seem to have a key role, we have less knowledge. Here, we investigate plant trait associations with abiotic and biotic factors for an animal dispersed plant community in the amazing tropical mountains of southern Ecuador. What did we do? We measure both abiotic and biotic factors in nine one hectare plots located along an elevation gradient. We recorded the abundance of common and selective trees of fleshy pretty plant species in the same plots. And finally, we measured free and seed and also lead traits in 18 and 33 plant species. We also conducted separate principal component analysis to identify the main independent dimensions of trait variation for fruit and seeds and also for leaves. Here you can read these findings. After that, we ran an RLQ analysis and we found that the general association between the main independent dimensions of trait variation identified and the abiotic and biotic factors were larger than expected under random community assembly. Let's look at the details. In this graph of an RLQ analysis for fruit and seed traits, red arrows are the main independent dimensions of trait variation, blue arrows are abiotic or biotic factors, closer arrows at pointed in the same direction show positive associations, while arrows in opposite directions show negative associations. The main interesting patterns in our system is that fleshy fruited plant species produce few large seeds inside larger fruits in rainy environments, whereas many small seeds inside small fruits were positively related with less rainy habitats. The production of abundant rich protein fruits was positively related with high temperature and at least an extent with feed removal. In terms of leaf traits, the production of cheaply constructed leaves was positively related with high temperature, interestingly. And leaf area decreased with increasing rainfall. Our findings suggest that the environmental filtering seems to be the main process which shapes the diversity of plant traits in our system. The novel finding here was the similar response of leaf and fleshy fruit traits to temperature and precipitation. I'm convinced that we provide a baseline for predicting changes in plant traits in highly diverse tropical communities in response to global change and associated changes. To end this presentation, I would like to thank all the institutions and people behind this project. Thank you for your attention. For coming today to my talk, Today, I'm going to talk about what influences bark conductance to water vapor in your tropical plants. 
I am Elenis Avila Lovera, and I am a postdoctoral researcher at the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute in Panama. So we know the bark conductance influences drop performance in neotropical trees. This is a recent study that shows how across different species from different sites, bark conductance to water vapor determines stem water deficit, meaning that those species that have greater water loss through their bark are also experiencing greater water deficit. And this can be important for when plants uh, respond to droughts, either seasonal droughts or future stronger droughts. And we also know that bark conductance and stem photosynthesis are positively related in desert plants. So this is a study that shows across different species as well, that those species with greater photosynthetic rates also have greater conductance to water in their bark meaning that features that make those sparks more conducive of water movement can also influence how much CO2 moves through that um, bark as well. So for this presentation, I wanted to ask the specific question that do stem morphometric traits, bioclimatic variables, and or share evolutionary history help explain variation in bark conductance among tropical species? And the way that we measure bark conductance is by dehydrating stems and weigh the, weighing them at different time intervals. So here we can see how this particular stem loses water through time. And then the slope of this curve is an estimate of how much, um, well, what's the rate at which this water is lost or the conductance of the bark. So we found that bark conductance depends on some morphometric traits, mainly subwood area and wood density. Here on the left panel, we can see that individuals with greater subwood area and potentially thicker stems have lower bark conductance. And we also see on the right that species with low wood density have low conductances. So how well built the wood is and how big the sapwood or that wood is as well are influencing how much water can be lost through the bark. We also wanted to know what were, if there were climatic variables that also explain variation in bark conductance. And to do that, we took the 19 uh, bioclimatic variables that we can download from WorldClim, and we performed a PCA to extract the main axis of climate variation. And we found that these main axis mostly separate individuals by where they live. So we have on the left, low seasonal precipitation, warmer forests, and on the right, high seasonal precipitation, cooler forest. And we found that when we use this climate PC as a predictor for bar conductance, those individuals in the low seasonal precip places that are also warmer have greater bar conductances compared to those in highly seasonal precipitation sites. And this is something that is telling us that despite bar conductance being dependent on how well built the stem is, is a trait that is also responding to changes in climate variables, particularly precipitation of seasonality and temperature. And we also found that closely related species have similar values of bar conductance. So this is a phylogenetic tree of the 92 species that we study. And we can see how, for example, in some areas like here, all the clusias or all the Clusaceae species that we study have very low values of uh, conductance, uh, bar conductance to water, whereas other clades have more warmer colors indicating greater values of bark conductance. So even though this Blomberg's K was low, it was significantly different from zero, indicating that signal is present in this data. So with that, we conclude that bar conductance depends on the morphometrics of the stems. So how thick is the wood and how well built it is. Key climatic variables of the habitats that the species inhabit. So seasonality of precipitation and temperature were the main ones, but also share evolutionary history. So this indicates that bar conductance is a trait that is very variable among species and that can actually respond to changes um, in the climate. And this can be important for how plants will respond to future climate change.
Hi, I'm Marina Fagundes. I work at the Restoration Ecology Lab at the Federal University of Northeast Brazil, and I'm here to share some results with you. I hope you like it. Disentangling facilitation and functional complementary effects on biomass production and community functioning during forest restoration. So in the present days, we know that several semi-arid lands are under severe anthropic pressure. And such devastation, combined with the global changes, can lead to desertification process. Uh, so in order to restore the semi-arid lands effectively, we have to use our theoretical knowledge related to ecological processes that structures the community. And we have to be able to disentangle these multiple effects and apply them in order to increase community productivity and functioning. Here we have some of the well-known processes on communities, uh, which are the selection effect related to community functional identity and the complementary effect related to how species interact between them. And our aim is to understand how facilitation, functional complementarity, functional identity and species, species diversity affect the productivity and the functioning of restored communities. We conducted our experiment in the Brazilian seasonally dry tropical forest, the Caatinga, and the experiment itself was conducted in the national forest of Asu. We built 147 experimental communities with 45 compositions, five levels of species diversity with high and low facilitation. And during four years, we measured as response variable the community productivity as the leaf biomass production and the community functioning calculated through the net biodiversity effect. And as predictable variables, we use the facilitation, the functional complementarity of communities, functional identity related to each trait measured, and species diversity. We use then a generalized linear mixed model in order to understand how the predictive variables explain both of our response variables. Here in the y-axis we have the productivity related to leaf biomass production and the x-axis we have all the 45 experimental compositions. And as you can see, most of the communities presented a positive uh, production, but the productivity did not increase as well the species diversity did. Instead, we had as main drivers of this productivity the facilitation, the functional identity of these communities related to a specific root area and higher root density. So when you look to the functioning of this community, we also can see that most of species perform better in mixture than in monocultures. Here once again, we have in the y-axis the, the net biodiversity effect and in the x-axis we have all the communities. And also, we don't have an uh, increasing in functioning as we increase species diversity. Instead, we have as the main drivers of this functioning the facilitation, and here the functional complementarity for the first time, and also the functional identity related to a specific root area, just like in the first analysis. So in short sentences, we have saw here that facilitation was fundamental to explain both the productivity and functioning of these restored communities, that functional complementarity, on the other hand, was important to explain community functioning but not community productivity, and the functional identity related to below-ground trades as specific root areas were very important to explain both productivity and functioning. So we can see here that facilitation is very important for the success of the restoration of such communities and should be treated and measured as an independent effect of functional complementarity. And specifically for the restoration of semi-arides, we highlight the importance of combining species with high facilitation power and high specific root area. Thank you for your time listening and please do not hesitate in contact us for more sharing.
Hi, my name is Gavani Chenevratna and I will be presenting on faunal diversity in Thangapur, Knuckles Mountain Range, Sri Lanka. The Knuckles Mountain Range consists of 34 densely forested peaks spreading over 18,500 hectares. This conservation forest, specifically the land rising 2,500 meters above sea level, was inscribed a World Heritage Center by UNESCO in 2010. It harbors a wide range of endemic and critical fauna and flora and is therefore considered a super biodiversity hotspot. This study was based in Thangapur, which is an uncharted area in the Knuckles Mountain Range and lacks biological records and data. This study aims to gather information that is vital for biodiversity documentation, sustainability biodiversity conservation and the management of the Thangapur region. Primary visual encounter survey was undertaken in 15 days, both day and night from October 2019 to February 2021 to document the diversity of several selected fauna groups such as birds, butterflies, amphibians, reptiles, mammals and fish in Thangapur. Pictured its study location and the areas that were surveyed. A total of 79 species of fauna were recorded of which 24% were endemic, 3% critically endangered, 8% endangered 3% vulnerable and 8% near threatened. The recorded avifauna comprised of 43 species where 7 are endemic. This included the Sri Lankan white tie who is nationally near threatened and the dark blue flycatcher who is nationally vulnerable and globally near threatened. Apart from the endemic species, two nationally near threatened species were also recorded. The thick flower flowerpecker and the black eagle. Additionally, the nationally vulnerable mountain hawk eagle was also observed. Of the 8 amphibian species recorded, two are critically endangered, the Pseudophilatus macrophus and Pseudophilatus sarsinora, while two are endangered, Pseudophilatus fulvus and Pseudophilatus alto. One is naturally near threatened and globally vulnerable, Pseudophilatus popularis, and one is naturally vulnerable and globally endangered, the Lankanectus corrugatus. Finally, two are near threatened, the Aperidon obscurus and Indosilvilla temporalis. Of the eight recorded species, the only non-endemic species was Indosilvilla temporalis. Of the five reptile species recorded, three are endemic, which includes the Sri Lanka bronze king, who is nationally vulnerable, the whistling lizard, who is endangered, and the leaf nose lizard, who is nationally critically endangered and globally endangered. Of the four mammals recorded, one is endangered, the other vulnerable and endemic and one is naturally endangered. Meanwhile, from the two fish species recorded, one is endemic, naturally vulnerable and globally near threatened, while the other is near threatened. Furthermore, 17 species of butterflies belonging to five families were observed. Unfortunately, few anthropogenic activities like unsuitable cardamom plantations, cattle farming and lack of awareness of residents was observed all which threaten this valuable ecosystem. Some of the existing measures includes that some areas are demarcated as protected areas by the Department of Forest Conservation. Meanwhile, Berry is currently studying and surveying the biodiversity in the area to make a proper database to be applied in biodiversity conservation and management planning. Meanwhile, future recommendations includes Awareness programs should be conducted to educate and encourage the locals to actively participate in conservation programs. Furthermore, future studies should be conducted to obtain the detailed information of the area. And then, proper conservation plans should be devised from the obtained information. In conclusion, observations of this survey indicate that there is a wide variety of microhabitats in Thangapur that harbor great diversity. However, Continuation of anthropogenic activities can cause several species to be driven to extinction and extirpation. In efforts to prevent that, this area will be systematically surveyed using additional methods so that detailed information on species richness and abundance can be gathered. This information will be used to create a detailed conservation plan.
thank you all uh, the panelists for all these great presentations. And now we open, we're uh, opening the session, the question and answer uh, session. We have uh, 10 minutes, a little bit less than 10 minutes. So I will read the first question, which is uh, for Omar Nevo. It's from uh, Flavia Sa. So uh, the question is, so are esters more volatile than sugars? Therefore, uh, they can be a more reliable characteristics of the ripened fruit? Um, yeah, so sugars are generally not very volatile. Um, the disaccharides are, are rather heavy and they are very hydrophilic, which means that in the watery fruit, they're basically staying. Um, and esters are, are very volatile. They're even more volatile than the smaller um, pieces that you use to build them, which is a bit counter, counterintuitive, but it's also because they are less uh, hydrophilic. They're less, um, they have lower affinity to water. So we know that this is also something that is happening in flowers and in nectar, that in order to volatilize them, in order to increase the, the volatile signature, the scent of an object, um, we have uh, esterification. So the joining of smaller hydrophilic compounds like alcohols and, and um, and acids that turn them into volatile compounds. And they are therefore more suitable for communication over a distance that, uh, and that would not require an animal to take a bite before it knows what's happening in the fruit. I hope it answers the question. Uh, great, thank you, Omar. Uh, uh, Flavia also has another question. Uh, this one for Jose Miguel. Uh, do different species of beetles share the same leaf or the same plant individual? Mm -hmm. Thank you for the question. Um, so the number of beetle species that attack each host plants range from one uh, to seven. And obviously for the plants that are attacked by only one beetle species, we will find only that beetle species. Uh, but for the plants that are attacked by, by more than one, you can either find in a single row leaf or in the individual, you can, fly, you can find one beetle species or more beetle species um, in, the, in, the, in the row leaves or individual. And also you can find leaves that they don't have any, any beetles. Thank you, Miguel. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, and, and Flavia has actually a question um, again for Omar. Uh, so the question is, uh, do esters and sugar share similar metabolic pathways? Um, yeah, so... Uh, Generally, yes. So est esters is a very broad uh, class of chemicals. Uh, what I was speaking about is aliphatic esters, and I didn't have much time there to, to explain this whole thing. But um, esters or aliphatic esters are a product of a sugar, uh, sorry, of, um, of an alcohol and an acid. And then the alcohols and acids, they can be products of uh, sugar. For example, fermentation of, um, of sugar leads to ethanol, and ethanol is an alcohol. And it can be also be oxidized and become an acid. And this is how you get this biochemical link between some sugars and some esters. Um, and then the plants can, can uh, use this link to, to, well, they can produce enzymes that, that produce the esters, that use this, um, this sugar products and create the ester signal. So in short, some esters are, can be downstream products of sugar, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I now have a question for, um, uh, for I think it's uh, Miguel, uh, Jose Miguel. Why do you think there's no, there is no relationship between beetle species richness di or diversity and leaf width in costaceae? Or better, what's, what's the difference between costaceae and the other families in, in which the relationship exists? That's a that's a great question. Um, so in, in other other chapters of my dissertation, I've been studying another set of uh, leaf traits that includes physical, nutritional, and, and chemical traits. 
And so far, the preliminary results show that uh, costacea is different in the sense that all the species uh, have uh, trichomes in both surface of the leaves. They have thicker uh, leaves and also a lower uh, fi fiber content. So one that is one of the difference that um, might be driving that only one beetle species fits on, on costacea. The same relationship applies for Singiveraceae, that only three beetle species fit on that family, and, and those beetle species, they don't fit in any other family. And Singiveraceae, we have found that they are uh, high, they are, they're the production of terpenes, it, it's high of uh, terpenoids in general, and also uh, phenylpropanoids. So overall, um, it might be a combination of uh, physical and chemical traits, but also the evolutionary history of those two families that are actually sister clades in the in the phylogeny or the order. Thank you, Jose Miguel. Uh, I have now a question for uh, Marina from Caroline uh, Dolstream. Sorry, I forgot to mention the previous question for, was uh, from Elenis Avila. Um, uh, so. Uh, Marina, which facilitation mechanism do you think uh, were occurring in your plots and were the effect of species with high uh, specific root area mostly related to their fast growth rate or because they increase the diversity of below ground traits? Hi, thanks for your question. So um, the Kachinga, it's a very dry area. It's a seasonally dry area. So we have a high, um, We have not just high solar instance, but high temperatures. So shadow, it's fundamental to decrease temperature. And also we can have um, some below ground traits acting as um, buffer from humidity. And related to the root area, I believe that we can have both. So the specific root area is fundamental to increase um, heterogeneity. So the species are able to share more resource, but also you have the individual, the specific effect of a species with higher um, root area increasing their own growth. Thank you, Marina. So the next question uh, is from Marcel Vaz and is uh, a question for Laura. Uh, so why do you think pioneer species are more widespread? Did you include terra firme and flooded forest alike? Hello, thank you for your question. So for our work, we found these species in more different uh, plots, characteristics. So we conclude that these species can survive in, in a more widespread way, you know, like in a more variable environment. So for our uh, study, we conclude that. And we just uh, include terra firme species. Thank you. And um... That there's a last, we have a last question um, uh, uh, for Laura. And this is from Sergio Estrada. Uh, and the question is, how was the environmental index calculated? Actually, the same question I had. Uh, thank you. Hello, thank you for your question. So we use a, in a function from package vegan, named beta gisper on R that is considered on one measure of multivariate dispersion that establish a centroid and calculate a distance from each species from the centroid that is based on the plot characteristics. So we, we kind of try to resume the, these characteristics of these plots in this function, beta gisper, name it beta gisper. Thank you. Thank you. 
And uh, thank you again to all of you. Uh, this was a great session. And uh, uh, if you if you want to discuss uh, more topics or more questions, please, uh, it's, it's easy to do to contact all speakers through WUVA. So I encourage you to do so. And I look forward to see you in the, in the next sessions. Have a great day.